This Week in Startups is brought to you by Wonder Capital, an award-winning platform to invest in solar energy projects across the U.S. Earn up to 8.5% annually while diversifying your portfolio, curbing pollution, and combating global climate change. Create your free account at wondercapital.com slash twist. And Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twist. Our iTunes review of the week is from 2020. As a 20 year vet in the business, I am still learning something new every time I listen. Great show with great guests. We have a great panel for you. We're going to get right into it. Uh, Patricia is with Trinity Ventures. Uh, Aiden is with Felicius. Jeff Clavier is with SoftTech. And Omar, of course, is with Sequoia Capital. Um, they all have incredible portfolios and have had tremendous success. Um, I know a couple of you in Fitbit. Omar, you sold your company to Google for $750 million, which is so quaint compared to now. Yeah, I know, little. Almost made it to the Unicorn Club. (laughs) If you had waited one more year, it would be worth $7.5 billion. There's that. um, Which I think is a great place to start, perhaps, which is looking at the valuation run-ups that we've had, a little bit of a correction in 2015, 2016, People pump the brakes a little bit. Um, how does Sequoia look at the valuation of some of these later stage companies today? How does that affect how you look at investing in Series A's today? Um, you know, I think that we <clears throat> try not to overfocus on valuations on any point in time. I think the general philosophy around investing for us has always been the same, and it's really around are these going to be transformative companies that are the most important ones in their industry. Um, their valuations that that will end up being, I think is going to be dependent on a lot of things that are outside of our control. So it really is more about, is this going to be the leader in this sector, or in this market, period, um, regardless of what the, the valuation of that means, because it's hard to predict what that will be in five or six years or whatever it is. And you started as a Sequoia founder, became a partner. What have you learned uh, since becoming a partner that you didn't know when you were just a founder? What's the number one thing you've learned? I think that um, probably, I sort of learned it when I was a founder, but I I got it more, it certainly doesn't need to be a Sequoia commercial, but like what I've, what, I remember when I was a founder at AdMob, I was, it, was, it was just me there, and I was incubated at Sequoia, and about two months in, um, YouTube was acquired. And YouTube obviously was a huge acquisition. Very, you know, one year I think after Sequoia invested, I thought there was going to be a party and champagne bubbles. And I remember going into the office, and everybody was kind of upset. And um, that was terrifying as a founder, because it just pointed to the fact that this was a not mean but very serious place about building big things. And I was really scared that I wasn't going to be able to. to sort of deliver on that, and I think that being inside, I've, I've had a lot of reinforcement of that, but it's not, it's not in a way where it's as scary as I thought it was. I think there's a lot of humanity to it that might not come through, but it, it's pretty serious about building big companies, I would say. I, I did so not So you really thought you were going to a that. party, yeah. but you were actually going to a wake. A little bit. <laughs> well, they, and it was a $1.6 billion sale, but Jeff, if you were looking at YouTube today, if it had figured out how to navigate the legal uh, and the legal pressure and also the mounting server bills at the time, what would YouTube with close to 10 billion in revenue now be worth in the public market if they hadn't chosen to sell for 1.65 billion to Google? The question is, would they have, would they have been able to sort of uh, rise the same way because being part of Google obviously sort of helped them a ton and who would have had the cojones to actually fund them the way Sequoia did with WhatsApp? Actually, do you have a party for WhatsApp? Um, do we have a party for 19 WhatsApp? 19 billion party? It was kind of, yes. Okay. Every, people um, were happier, I would say. Because <laughs> that's what I heard. Um, so he was in WhatsApp. Yeah. For sure he was. It's all, it's all about, you know, can you get the incremental capital which gets you to the next level, which attracts other investors without going too far, both in terms of how much you raise and the valuation you get. And so, you know, I think um, what I've learned over the past... Um, 13 years is 
you can try and rewrite history. Like I would want to go back and say yes to Uber, but I said no, and you know, there's no point in trying to sort of change that. So. Well, you open the door. Tell me about the meeting with Uber and what was on your list of reasons of why you said no. Sure. Um, so not that I remember precisely the moment. Yeah, it's good. No, denial um, is a June strong 2000, tool. June 2010, <laughs> we're in the Eventbrite office. Um, and Saka uh, shows up with Travis and Ryan Graves, and Ryan Graves uh, pitches this concept. And at that time, I don't think they had the two fake limos sort of going around San Francisco, and the app looked really, really sort of... Um, Clunky? Early days. Um, and at the end of the day, I asked Travis if he was gonna be the CEO of the company, and he said no. And right. for me, um, and I have nothing against Ryan, uh, but I didn't think that Ryan was actually the guy who was going to take the company to the next level. And so I passed because of that. And then we went to um, this uh, angel thing that you organized. Open angel at, forum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at Winston Cesaris. And I was like, maybe I should do it. And then in September of 2010, there was 100K left in the Uber round. And I said, OK, I'll take it. And emailed Ryan and said, hey, you know, how are you doing? I heard, you know, can I come? And he said, oh, excited that you're in, excited. Um, no. Ah. Payback's a bitch. <laughs> um, I didn't, um, since we're doing therapy now. <laughs> I'm okay. Therapy. I'm okay. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Um, tell us about your greatest miss and how you just totally blew it. I mean, honestly, like, there's a very long list. But Let's the start one with the thing, biggest. No, no, I can tell. So, I mean, I did the same thing at Uber. In fact, it was probably even worse for me because I didn't even check the demo. Um, I had two chances to invest in Airbnb at $2 million valuation. I still have the email printed in my office, Brian Chesky saying, are you sure? $2 million valuation? Like, you don't want to put in, like, 25 k And look, I mean, the reality is the context, the hindsight is perfect. But I can tell you this. The one interesting thing for me is many people can take that and say, I screwed up, it was a failure. But for me, I took those two things and I turned it into a win in the sense that, ah, oh, God damn it, I missed Uber, I missed Airbnb, but if they're gonna grow, they're gonna have to process global payments, there has to be a company. And I went to Morgan Stanley and they're like, look, there's a company that's powering international payments for Braintree, it's called Adyan, it's in the Netherlands, they might be hermits and they might not even wanna talk to you, but that's the company and it took me three years I did get into the company, and after we get into the company, they close one after another. Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Spotify, Uber, Airbnb. Uh, they, I don't think there is a Netflix. There is a big company that they don't power global payments. Probably going to be one of our biggest investments. Probably one of the most expensive deals that I've done. That's to tell you, you can still take failure and turn it into a win, and you can never extrapolate from extremes it's because it's in the extremes and the really tough ones where I think greatness really happens. And you need to have the mental serendipity and comfort level to like allow that to happen. Um, so, okay, Patricia, you're up next. Tell us about it. A big miss. <laughs> you're, okay. you're amongst friends. Therapy. There's well, 500 so LPs here who are willing to hear your confession. <laughs> uh, we learn from our mistakes. You know, one for me was um, was Pete Flint. And truly, I'd mentored him when he was a second year at the GSB. Um, and, you know, super bright guy for all of you who know Pete. And he, he'd iterated on the product, was moving super fast. And, um, and I was looking at investing in Truly and looking at investing in another real estate tech company um, called My New Place, which with an experienced CEO who had a prior win in, win in the real estate tech space. And sort of thought, I can't do both of these. I got to pick one and um, picked my new place, which ended up being acquired by a company called Real Page in the real estate, which is, was a double, it was fine, um, but it wasn't a Trulia. And, you know, to, to, to like have seen that talent and see that potential um, and not pulled the trigger, um, you know, yeah, it was miss. And in fairness, when, you, when it was called my dash new dash place, the two dashes should have told you that was a mistake. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the branding wasn't like domain. top class, yeah. Hey everybody, I am so, so excited to tell you about a new partner we have here at This Week in Startups. This is an amazing one. It's called Wonder Capital with a U, W-U-N-D-E-R Capital. And what they are doing is they're helping you combat 
global climate change and make money at the same time. All right, here's how it works. They are an award-winning online investment platform that lets you invest in solar energy projects across these United States of America. And you can earn up to 8.5% annually. Do you know what your money's making right now in a savings account? Go take a look. It's not 8.5%. And this will diversify your portfolio and it will curb pollution and combat global climate change, which if you're listening to this program, you have a very high IQ, you're a very refined individual, and you know that global climate change is a real issue. If you're listening to This Week in Startups, you're obviously not a dummy. Your investment goes directly into helping U.S. SMBs install solar panels. You know what SMBs are if you're listening to this program, small and medium-sized businesses. And those businesses will repay their loans to wonder with a U, and you get monthly payments directed into your bank account, right? Direct deposit, right in there. Best of all, Wonder Capital takes no fees for investing your money. Kind of screwing it up for me. I, my, I take 20%, 25% of what my LPs give me. I get a carry, but Wonder Capital takes no fees. They offset the CO2 emissions from almost 3 million pounds of coal burned. How amazing is that? I'm so proud that they're a sponsor of this program. They're supporting independent media, and they're going to help you make up to 8.5% a year. This is what the true fans of This Week in Startups need to do right now. Go create a free account at wondercapital.com slash twist. Remember, that's with a U, W-U-N-D-E-R capital.com slash twist. And you can do well and do good at the same time. I've heard of triple uh, bottom line companies. This one feels like a quadruple bottom line company. Look at the U.S. small businesses here in the United States of America. We're going to make America great again. They're going to get loans for their solar. You're going to get an 8.5% return. The planet is going to get saved. And hey, Wonder is probably going to do pretty well too. Quadruple bottom line capitalism from Wonder Capital. Wondercapital.com slash twist. And if you're a super fan of the show, say thank you at Wonder Capital for supporting at Jason and TWI Startups. Go ahead and do that on Twitter and I will like it and retweet it. All right, let's get back to this amazing program. 10 years ago when we were all, well, when I was starting to invest and stuff and Omar, you were starting the company, how many viable, let's call it Series A viable companies, would you see every month? And how has that changed today? Because the goalposts seem to have moved very, moved very far down the field. When Omar and I were doing startups, when AdMob came out, you could raise a Series A pre-revenue, pre-product market fit. You could raise it based on a, a prototype or a demo, correct, Omar? Yeah, um, when I raised the Series A for AdMob, it was just me, one person. I had a product, um, it was doing maybe 10 or 15K in revenue a month, and but one person, and it was a Series A. That, that was the, that was. And that Series A size was? $3.3 million. So essentially the. Right into the microphone. That's, that's a seed round. That's a seed round. Yeah. No. <laughs> so I think that the market, and, and uh, Manu Kumar has, has sort of written about this on his blog, um, it's all about just shifting the investment landscape where you have the pre-seed world, so Manu, uh, Charles Hudson, a few others, YC, that essentially give the initial capital to build the product to entrepreneurs. Then you have people like Aiden and us who essentially give them the capital to launch and average uh, investment for a software company for us is two to three million. So we will do one, one and a half. The round will be two to three. Hardware companies are more expensive um, so they will, they will raise three to four as a seed round. And then they will, you know, hit the market, get some addition, um, initial traction, some, some sort of meaningful revenue, and then they will get to Series A, which is in the, you know, six, eight, ten sort of uh, order. So that used to be a Series B. Yeah. Right? I mean, all, the, all, these label, all these labels are really more just conveniences for us at this point. They're essentially meaningless. Fundraising is just a continuum. It goes from, you know, 25K all the way up to $100 million and beyond. And there's really no particular logical breaks. Yeah. And founders are always fundraising. So essentially now it's, it's, it's no longer like these. But there is one big difference, points. Omar, which is the number of companies that have been funded. We've never seen a class of this many angel investors. We've never seen angel list syndicates, seed invest, and now Republic doing Title III crowdfunding. How does the sheer number of people participating, Omar, change this, if it changes it at all? I, th I think it absolutely changes it. I mean, I think it can certainly be argued that technology is more pervasive than ever. 
um, and that obviously people have more access to, to, to the internet and to communications and technology and therefore there's going to be more value created. But um, our entire industry is essentially a filter and mm -hmm. the more there is coming in, the much harder it is to see and predict and find those good things that are going to be able to come out. So. Aiden, how do you handle the sheer number of companies? Because it is enormous. Just taking Y Combinator there as an example, when Paul started it, six companies, Absolutely. now 120, 130 per class. And you have a demo day where they're going on stage for 90 seconds, Absolutely. I think. Absolutely. In fact, let me tell you, so I was one of the Can you guys hear him? Can you guys hear me? Good. Perfect. I was one of the first uh, individual investors in YC. Uh, some of my early investors were investments were YC <coughs> companies. I think we invested in like Weebly uh, and also Justin TV, predecessor of Cruise, at like three million dollar valuation. And each YC batch had 12 companies, which was like the beautiful like days. And now it's like 100, 150 companies, and I don't think there was like a valuation less than 10 million. I feel like in terms of the overall trend, the number of seed companies have expanded by like a factor of 100x. But then if you look at companies that are valued over a billion, now let's also be very honest, just because they're valued over a billion dollars doesn't mean that they're going to go public or get acquired. It's not realized value, it's paper value. That number is increasing much more you know, linearly. And so the proverbial needed on the haystack, that probably ratio has gotten 100 times worse. And I tell people, like, I was, just had the luxury of being the first ex-Google angel. If I was number three, I don't even know if I would be sitting here today. Things have developed so fast. Um, the best thing about you know, leaving Google early, in addition to the crazy amount of money I left on the table, I got married and I started with my dream job, which I feel like I get to do what's the best thing in the world today. But this kind of ratio of startups is really, really crazy. So we also change our ratio of looking at things. And you know, it's not just about How do you filter, anymore. Patricia? Well, I was going to say, I mean, I think, I think the end result is there really is a, what's what's been called a Series A crunch. It used to be called a Series B crunch, by the way. That existed for a long time. Now it's a Series A crunch. And I do think that the, uh, you know, a lot of companies are coming to market for a Series A, and they're kind of in that tweener mode. Um, and they're asking, that sort of the, the round size they're looking for at the valuation they're looking for just is out of line with kind of where they're at from a progress perspective relative to, say, seed, seed funding opportunities and Series B opportunities. So when I look at sort of the investments we've made in 2015, I would say about 40 to 50% of our investments were Series A, and you know, we do that continuum from C to Series B. In 2016, it's more like 20%, and, and it, was flip, it was flipped to a Series B. We're doing more Series B in 2016, just because you know, in that cohort we saw, they were just kind of felt like the risk return was better at that stage. Because you had uh, specific traction you could look at in those Series B investments, and the valuation relative to the traction made it attractive. Right, rather than you know, investing eight to 10 million, at a Series A, where there's maybe like three to six months of you know, in-market data relative to being in market maybe 18 to 24 months, and you're raising 10 to 15. I mean, it, that, that in the past year has felt like a more comfortable place to be. I want to add a quick parenthesis. I think there is kind of an increasing dichotomy in the market. Uh, all of this stuff is mostly concentrated in Silicon Valley, but on the other hand, if I look at our portfolio, our fastest revenue growth company comes from Australia. One of the highest value companies is in Holland, and then our first IPO comes out of Ottawa, uh, Canada, and a lot of folks like Benchmark told them, you can't build a valuable company anywhere but Silicon Valley. So on the one hand, we're facing extremes in Silicon Valley where it's impossible to hire employees, it's impossible to pay them, everything is at least three times expensive, rent is probably five times expensive, but internationally, you know, labor costs is probably 20%, rent costs are like 15%. Yes, there is a lot lower density, but if one is willing to look at extremes like frontier tech or different geographies and get out of the comfort zone, actually it's not that bad. So there's also some like great stories and I think the, the, the only thing that I will give ourselves credit for is it became very obvious to me that even early on in like 2008, 2009, 2010, there is no glory in trying to be the 101st VC doing exactly what everybody else is doing. So we were like one of the earliest, especially for our fund size, to look international, go across stage, I th and, and to go into Frontier Tech, like we did Fitbit when nobody even like was calling wearable. So I think there are some really great stories that are gonna come surprise people in a lot more industries than they're thinking about. 
hey, everybody, I want to tell you about a great product, which you've probably heard about, but maybe you haven't tried yet, and I have tried it, and I love it. It has become a big hit in my household with my seven-year-old daughter. It's called blueapron.com. My wife loves it, too. Go to blueapron.com slash twist, and you'll get your first three meals free with free shipping. It is an incredible experience. You get a box. It's obviously refrigerated, and all the ingredients and a beautiful menu card and a recipe card of how to make the product. So I've always wanted to make pizza at home. I've never done it. I mean, I made English muffin pizzas. You know, this is what we call Irish pizza when you're growing up in Brooklyn. But they sent a beautiful pizza dough and beautiful sauce and cheese and everything, all perfectly portion sized and an easy to follow recipe. Then the other thing I've always wanted to learn how to cook is General Tso's chicken. That was one of my favorites when I was in New York and I was living on the west side in Hell's Kitchen. I walk home from the garden after watching the Knicks win a playoff game. I get General Tso's chicken. I never knew how to make it. They give you all the ingredients, a little cornstarch, so all these little syrups, and you like a little uh, professional chef. Everything just goes smoothly. It is an incredible experience. It's also affordable. You get a ton of variety. It's super flexible. You get the deliveries when you want. Um, and it really, it, I was just amazed by the quality of the bok choy, of the chicken. Everything was the highest quality. And it saves you not only from going to the supermarket, not only from getting a recipe, but also the portion sizes and, and how to put this all together. It makes cooking delightful again. And they are in partnership with 150 local U.S. farms, fisheries, ranchers. And they, you know, so I'm a big seafood fan and we love going to the Mon Monterey Bay uh, Aquarium. And when I went there last time, they had this beautiful card that told you which fishes you should order, which are sustainable. But it's very hard to, to actually get that uh, certified. You know, people lie when they sell you fish. You don't know what you're getting. You don't know if it's actually sustainable or not. And even some of the stuff that's farm raised is actually not good for the environment. Well, you know what? Blue Apron takes all that away. They do all of that important work for your family. And it's very important to our family that we order sustainable stuff and we and we don't take stuff from the ocean that's not sustainable. It's a, it's a big movement uh, amongst considered people. So the fact that they use the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch list to me and their standards is very impressive. Um, prep is, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. It's super, I mean, we did it faster in some cases, but we're fast cooks. Um, it tastes great. It's easy. It's a better way to cook. It is a better way to cook. Just, and also delicious. I mean, I made this beautiful Sicilian pizza and my daughter ate it all. It was one of those great experiences where we, you know, she was looking in the oven, counting the minutes. So blueapron.com slash twist, blueapron.com slash twist, T-W-I-S-T, and you'll get your first three meals free with free shipping. It is amazing. All right, let's get back to this amazing program. Omar, you, you, I know Sequoia did a lot of investing in India and in China, but the truth is, here in the United States, at least, there's only, in the, in the, since 2000, I think we could name one company that became worth more than $10 billion outside of the Valley, it's Snapchat. Has there been another one? Is it really worth getting on a plane and leaving Silicon Valley when there's so much opportunity in Silicon Valley? Be candid. Uh, I think... Yeah, actually, so, I mean, the way we think about it, I think it just, it, when it's outside of Silicon Valley, it raises the bar for us, and it's not because we necessarily think that Silicon Valley itself is a magical place. It's more because we believe that's where our network is and our ability to help the company is the strongest. And so if a company is trying to raise a Series A and they are located somewhere outside of Silicon Valley, it raises the bar for us, but we absolutely will consider it. It just raises the bar. Pretty, and, and the later they are, the, the, the closer the bars come together, right? So if it's a growth stage investment, it's frankly less important where the company is located than if it's a seed stage investment. Jeff, what's the end game for the rising cost of starting a company in Silicon Valley? Is it going to break and are we going to see people, you know, just leave or are we going to see people leave and go to Berkeley, Oakland, you know, and, and some surrounding towns. I think, so we start seeing that in the sense that um, some companies will start spinning up an engineering team, so our company's then reach, mm -hmm. um, has opened a, uh, an office in uh, Waterloo, and they have now 40 some engineers over there because the uh, sheer cost of having the same workforce in the Valley, if you can hire it, is almost 2x. 
Um, and they're transient, aren't they? In the Valley, they're going to stay 18 months. In Waterloo, they're going to stay 40 months, mm -hmm. 50 months. Then you could, you know, we see people who have moved to San Francisco go back to, uh, you know, San Bruno <coughs> or, you know, areas like that where the rents are cheaper both for, you know, commercial and, and personal sort of uh, rents. Um, we see now, um, to um, uh, Aiden's point, some companies having engineering in Europe or where it's sort of cheaper but with talent and business and sales in the US. So we've actually seen models where people are trying to cope with the mounting cost and competition for, for talent. That but, actually, oh, sorry. But you know, other companies are just scaling up in San Francisco and yes, it costs more, but as we've heard, all the rounds are just larger to cope with that. I mean, there's always sort of the interesting question, which is, did we raise larger funds because the rounds were larger, yeah. or yeah. did we enable larger yeah. rounds because we raised larger funds? Yeah, that actually brings up, when I mean, you were talking about 10 years ago when we were starting companies, one of the things that really didn't work was having an, that, that engineering team somewhere else, especially in a startup when you're built. I, I've seen that now actually working on two of portfolio yeah. companies. So one, one being Pixar, where their engineering team is in Armenia, and App Annie, their engineering team is in China. And it actually, through the tools and technology, and I think the internet itself, it's actually functional. And I was surprised by that, because I'm sort of, historically I would be like, no, that's never gonna work. Everybody has to be in the same place. Okay, but, we're gonna run out of time. Yeah. I wanna end on two very important questions. The first uh, we're gonna do really quick, which is bad behavior at, in startup land. We have a lot of tourists, we have a lot of fake entrepreneurs, a lot of people playing the part of entrepreneurs, and we see things like Theranos, which appears to be complete utter mm -hmm. fraud. You see things like Zenefits, which appears to be a founder who basically broke a lot of rules and then David Sachs coming in and fixing it and saving it. Hampton Creek, maybe a little bit of shenanigans in the middle. How do you look at this, Patricia? How do you avoid the, the very real problem in Silicon Valley, which I kind of think started with Facebook, which breaks shit and then we'll figure it out later, pay the fines. The fines will be de minimis compared to the valuation, but when you don't hit critical mass like Facebook did, the fines equal your company's gone, your investment's gone, and a lot of egg on your face. Did you meet with Elizabeth Holmes? Did you guys consider investing in Theranos? Yes or no? No, that's not a sector we invest in. But I just, I think there's a lot of FOMO in Silicon Valley, right? And so uh -huh. there's like, you hear about hype, you hear about buzz, you go chasing after it. And, uh, and people like, you know, look at how much companies have raised at what valuation as an indicator of success. And I think that's the first mistake. Mm. Just like look at the fundamentals of the business. Um, there, those are important signals, of course, because there are smart people making those investments at high valuation. But at the end of the day, you have to do your own diligence. Are and, they smart people they're... making those valuations? Or do you look at some of the people who came in in the last investments and say, those people are also tourists. I mm. haven't seen them here the last 10 years. Yeah, I'd say it's a mix. I think that's a fair point. I think it's a mix. I, didn't. Uh, I did not invest or see Terranos. I did see and invest in Dollar Shake Club and Cruise. And the example that I'm using, number one, like we talk about Snapchat, but let's also talk about Realize Exits. I'm very proud of Dollar Shake Club. I was a small investor. Kirsten Green should be the proud investor who's going to be on the But panel. there were no shenanigans in that company. There were no shenanigans, but the point that I was going to make is there is so much FOMO in the investing world that everybody feels like they need to go focus their money on the guaranteed successes. That's one of the reasons why we're trying to do things that are really difficult to do. I'm not saying investing outside of Silicon Valley or US is easy. Investing in cruise when nobody was even talking about self-driving cars was not easy. Everybody thought it was insane. Dollar Shave Club, they thought Mike Dubin was crazy and it was losing too well, he, much money. In fairness, he was a little crazy. I mean, but you saw the video. I don't, I don't know if you can be an entrepreneur and not be crazy. I mean, Fair I was pretty crazy too. Like, <laughs> 10 VCs told me I was like dumb and I couldn't be in VC. So there's I'm a like, line oh, between can. crazy and the fraud. The good crazy and, and then fraud. the crazy that goes over the line. So Jeff, as we, how do you look at it? We've really sort of increased dramatically in the time we spend in, uh, in due diligence and try and find out about those potentials, especially when you invest in Frontier Tech where it's pure science, where we try and figure out, you know, who are the experts that we can trust <coughs> to tell us whether this is for real or not. And if ever we have a doubt, we just pass. Omar, when you saw uh, Theranos have a bunch of, like, 70-year-old generals join their board, but no legitimate VCs, did you cringe? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, Obviously, there were a lot of things that sort of made you wonder what was happening at the company. I would say that was one of those. I mean, I didn't follow the story that closely, but that was not a, that was not a good sign, <laughs> for sure. Well, how do you look at avoiding fraud knowing that 
a lot of what founders do is delusional, self-fulfilling prophecy. How do you know that? Because you know that you were rubbing two nickels together to try to make ad mob work. Yeah. It was all duct tape yeah. at one point. For sure. It could have fallen apart. Yeah. How do you know the difference between all of these uh, we're, sort of we're situations? We're fundamentally in a business that's about people, right? And so yeah. it's the same way you know anything about anything about anyone. And I think it, part of it is just not to get so excited and so blinded by the technology or the product or, or the market or the sales or the numbers to forget that there's like a human being doing this and you need to know them and you need to somehow get close to them or get around them or meet, talk to people who, who have worked with them and really figure out what their background is. And if at the end of the day, eventually people still will at some times disappoint you, but I think we are in an optimistic business and we try and be optimistic. I mean, all of us, that's, that's uh, our, that's our One quick thing to add there, I think a lot of times in venture, prevailing wisdom is you wait for the companies to come to you and you look for the signal to see if you're gonna go and make that investment. I think if you follow the signal instead, like I'm gonna use an example, and unfortunately the company's not doing super well now, but when we first made the investment in Rovio, it was the largest mobile app in Which the one? world. With WhatsApp, Rovio. Rovio. Rovio and WhatsApp were the top two mobile apps for a really long time. The reason, the day I realized that that was gonna be a good investment is when I was sitting in Redwood City in random theater, and some like 30 year old female next to me was playing Angry Birds, and I've never seen somebody like play computer games before. I'm like, have you ever played games? She's like, no, but I love this game. And so it's, it's a crazy example, but the thing is, I think the thing that has worked best for us, and, and I love this like latest Jeff Bezos quote, so many people try to focus on things that are changing, we like to focus on things that don't change. Like people will always want things cheaper and faster. So like look at the signal, look at the real signals in the okay. world where things are happening and so, try to translate that into investment decisions. Well, so avoid this like fraudulent situations. Um, we're not gonna get out of this without a Trump discussion. Um, I'm gonna frame this um, strictly in terms of business. You do realize the international background of the panel, so it's gonna be fun. <laughs> we'll, we're gonna check visas later. <laughs> we are not gonna be deported, right? Hope your right? papers are in order. Wait, they're not deporting people with US passports. No. <laughs> this, we got some Stasi downstairs. Um, let's, uh, too soon? Um, I'm gonna ask it this way, because let's face it, the people in this room are gonna benefit tremendously by tax cuts, repatriation of capital coming in, um, and probably also wildly offended by what happened this past weekend with immigration. Which is gonna have a more profound effect on our business with Trump? The insane executive order chaos from things like immigration or the massive, massive tsunami of capital that will be coming back to the United States through reparation, uh, re repatriation and uh, through tax cuts and through a two trillion dollar stimulus infrastructure package. Which will have a more beneficial impact on the venture industry without any other comment? Repatriation about. of capital. Probably capital. Um, the lack of talent that we get from immigrants will be sorely missed. But which will have a more profound effect on our business? Well, I think in the short term, getting the cash will actually be- Into the microphone. In the short term, the cash, in the long term, we'll score ourselves by not having the talent. Incredibly well done splitting the difference. Omar? <laughs> I, I think that the, the cash will obviously make a difference. I think it's not just immigration. I think there's going to be just a lot of uncertainty for a long time, and that's going to be the most profound effect. Is it's just, we don't know what's next. And that's a big I think big issue. it's well said, and um, I've left myself out of it, but I will say one comment that I would like to say, which is, all of us in this industry who are now maybe fighting with each other about the approach of how to deal with this chaos, and this is, regardless of who you voted for, complete and utter chaos. Whether you're Elon Musk and Travis trying to work with this person who's creating chaos, or you're into disengaging like Troy and Chris Saka and other people who want to fight uh, the good fight, none of us created this mess. And we're all the Jedi Knights who are trying to solve the problem in the Republic, and I think we have to not be stabbing each other and not break ranks and try to work towards a better future. I don't, I don't know if uh, I'm overstepping my bounds with Mark Suster by I saying that, but I really feel like the fact that we're attacking an Elon Musk or a Travis or other people who are trying to work with them and are on those committees, or Sheryl Sandberg who's getting attacked now, she's gonna be attacked this day. If we're attacking people who are trying to solve the problem, whether you disagree with their, their uh, process for trying to solve it, I think we all are trying to solve this and make America better. You agree? 
I think the only thing I was going to add, I mean, look, I, I'm an immigrant. I came out of H-1B green card. I mean, I'll be very honest. If I was like a couple years late, I don't think I would be here. I don't think I would even be in the U.S. So I'm very grateful for what I have. But I will also tell you one thing. The thing that scares me more is that we're getting more polarized in this, this what you just said, that people are getting even more disengaged and like getting ready for the good fight. I'm like, aren't we all citizens of the same country, immigrants or not? Like, why are we trying to like do dialogue and try to set right example? I mean, look, I don't know what's going through Trump's mind, but what scares me most is this polarization and like, you basically uh, are a traitor if you don't fight the fight, you're a traitor if you're on the other side of the fight. There's just no way to win. And I feel like the people that want to ensue a dialogue and find like the happy medium are, are losing. And that's just not fair. I, I don't think we should lose that, that sense. I, you feel I, compelled I do, to say something. I was just, yeah. I was just saying, I, I do think a, a silver lining of all this is that um, I, this, this, this whole episode, I think, is unleashing a lot of innovation around improving communication between government and citizens and increasing transparency and advocacy. And I don't know if they're going to be for-profit businesses or not-for-profits, but I, it feels like there's just tons of, of ideation going on about how to improve so that there isn't this polarization, to improve, to, to lessen the polarization. Well, we're certainly getting a big lesson on what the actual rules of our democracy are yeah. and how they work. Yeah. I mean, I think we all had to look up exactly what is an executive order and yeah. how do they work. I was on the Wikipedia page, and it's not very clear, actually. Thank you, Google. <laughs> All right, this has been, I'm sorry for the political uh, little um, diversion there, but we have to discuss it because it's what everybody's discussing out there. Um, an amazing panel. Let's hear it from Thank Patricia, Iden, Jeff, and Omar. Our iTunes review of the week is from 2020. As a 20-year vet in the business, I am still learning something new every time I listen. Great show with great guests. 